Good morning, everybody. I'm trying out a new microphone, and so uh, when some of y'all come on here, if you can let me know if you're able to hear me. I sure hope you are. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just lip syncing. Anyway, I am Denise Pass with Sing Deep Ministries, and it is a joy to be able to share with you every day as we go through the Word of God and we see deep in a shallow world and we overcome the battles of the mind with the Word of God. And today we're reading out of the book of Numbers, chapters 9 through 12. Hey there, Diane. Hey, Diane, can you hear me? Because I've got a new microphone on this. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Hey there, Belia. Good to see you. So we're reading from Numbers, y'all. And uh, I don't know about you, but today was a riveting read. I could see myself in the pages here. So God commanded the Israelites to celebrate the second Passover at the beginning of chapter 9. And Passover is a Jewish festival celebrating the exodus from Egypt and the Israelites' freedom from slavery to the Egyptians. The Feast of Passover, along with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, was the first of the festivals to be commanded by God for Israel to observe. That's You can look at Exodus 12 for that. Commemorations today involve a special meal called the Seder. I've had that before. don't know if you have, but it's pretty neat to be involved in that. Featuring unleavened bread and other food items symbolic of various aspects of the Exodus. So this is from the Easy English Bible Commentary. Just a little background because I, I realize we can read it and say they're celebrating the Passover and you're like, jolly good. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Well, I'm sure a lot of you do, but... So the night of the first Passover was the night of the 10th plague. And on that fateful night, God told the Israelites to sacrifice a spotless lamb and mark their doorposts and lentils with its blood. So I imagine that seems a little bit weird to us. You know, we're going to go outside our door and paint blood around our door frame. Well, there's a good reason for it. And so we understand that the blood of Christ covers our sins. And so in the Old Testament, there was the blood of sin offerings, offerings that were on to cover our sins. And so because of this plague that was happening to Egypt, as God delivered his people from Egypt, he told them, put door over that door frame, and I'm not going to have the destroyer hit your house. He's going to pass over your house. And so that's what that's about. Um, it's funny. I love sometimes the simplicity of things. You know, we make things so complicated. Simply, pass over. He passed over them. Um, and so we're passed over when we have the blood of Christ over us. Amen? Praise God. We don't have judgment. There's therefore now no condemnation for those of us who have the blood of Christ on us by accepting his free salvation. So what's interesting to me about this observance was it was at God's command. It was not just like a holiday where they're just kind of hanging out, chilling, you know. There's a moment of reflection on what God did for them. God wanted his people to remember his rescue. We tend to be a forgetful people too, don't we? And so remembering God's rescue would help them to remember their purpose so they would not just live for this world. That's what happens. We kind of get caught up in the day in, day out so hard, the daily grind, and we can forget we're on mission here. So how do we remember? You know, there's different things that we do here. There's We celebrate Christmas and Thanksgiving, or you know, maybe those are times where we are thankful to God, Easter. But these are holidays that we're not commanded to do, right? We choose to do because we want to remember what God did, but it's easy for those to become kind of rote, isn't it? That's just the way it is with our flesh, I think. And so we've got to be real intentional to say, and not just on special days, but we can certainly remember when Christ came and when he rose again, uh, when he was crucified. But I believe every day of our life, we need to put things to help us remember because we drift. That's the natural, right? So in chapter 10, the Lord spoke to Moses about the role of the trumpets. My husband likes that. He's a trumpet player. And moving the camp forward as they began their journey to the promised land. God journeyed with them. And I just love reading about the cloud covering them, you know, and then lifting and they would go. God went with his people. 
I, sometimes I think we wish it could be a little more obvious for us that we know his presence. He is there with us, though. And I think we sense that the more we pause, I'm just going to pause right now, and are still before him, and we seek him, we sense his presence. So in chapter 11, God's people complained and incurred judgment on themselves. They complained about hardship. Anyone else done that? Come on. If you've complained about hardship, let's be real. You can give a like or, I don't know, frowny face. <laughs> no, no, no frowny faces. Uh, and they complained about God's provision, right? Anyone else complained about provision? Yeah, I think we all have, right? We've all been a bunch of whiners, if we're honest, at some point in our walk with God. We felt we deserved better or more, right? And why didn't this happen to somebody else? Everything always happens to somebody else, right? We have the phrase that we say, this is for the birds. Well, I mean, those poor birds. I mean, life is hard. Christ promised us problems. We just don't think it's fair, right? We don't think it's fair if we go through something hard. Well, let's look a little bit at Numbers 11, verses 1 through 6. Now, the people began complaining openly before the Lord about hardship. When the Lord heard, his anger burned, and fire from the Lord blazed among them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So that place was named Taborah because the Lord's fire had blazed among them. And then here comes the complaints about the food. The riffraff among them had a strong craving. Strong craving. I like how it says riffraff in this CSB translation here. Strong craving for other food. Can any mamas here say amen? <laughs> Parents say amen. We get this, right? If you've ever had kids who are complaining because they didn't get the food they wanted, you know, the Israelites wept again and said, Who will feed us meat? We remember the free fish. Free, y'all. Just remember that word. We ate in Egypt, along with the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There's nothing to look at but this manna. So I have to tell you this morning, this made me think of the song by Keith Green. Um, so you want to go back to Egypt. And so I'm going to put that link in so you guys can hear it, but it's hilarious. And he talks about, you know, some of their complaints, you know, and they want, they're sick of the banana bread and they're, they want the, the leeks and onions they remember they used to eat by the Nile River, right? <laughs> I like, it's interesting that it says free food. Y'all, that food was not free. We're talking slavery, all right? So sometimes our remembrance can really... Uh, not be accurate, right? The good old days that we want to remember maybe had some affliction in it that we don't recall, right? I'll never forget when my uh, oldest daughter was diagnosed with celiac disease and she was seven years old and she had been losing a lot of weight. And so she was 40, like 40 something, like 40 pounds. And uh, I had taken her to doctor after doctor and just, you know, you moms know, you dads know too, when your child is sick, you are wrought with worry and crying out to God. And anyway, finally got the answer. And I just wept before God. I was so thankful for the answer. And shortly thereafter, I was diagnosed with autoimmune diseases and having a real hard time. And I remember crying out to the Lord and asking him, God, will it ever be easy again? And the answer was, no. But my grace is sufficient for you. I didn't want that answer. Can I just be honest? You know, this is supposed to happen to someone else. I want the life of ease. I don't want to go through pain. I don't want my daughter to suffer. You see, but we live in a fallen world where there will be suffering. We just didn't expect that, right? And so when it happens, we get disillusioned. We wonder what God's up to. We can doubt him. We might even question his character. And so as parents listening right now, we understand the complaining, but we've also probably done some of the complaining. You know, perhaps when things are hard or perhaps when things happen that we didn't expect, you know, we can kind of wonder, 
what God's up to. But the root behind our complaining and behind the Israelites complaining is where the sin lies. It says in scripture that God's people were rejecting God. And guess what? God was with them. So if you've ever heard someone talk about you and you're like right there, <laughs> I actually prefer that to when people talk about you and you're not there, like when they do it behind your back. That's a little harder. But here they're talking about God. God's obviously hearing everything they're saying and they're rejecting him. And pouring out our complaints to God is different than complaining to God. See, about God and, and saying it's not good enough versus Lord, help me, help me to bear this. So Numbers 11, 18 through 20 shows the cause of their discipline. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves in readiness for tomorrow and you will eat meat because you wept in the Lord's hearing. Who will feed us meat? We were better off in Egypt. The Lord, the Lord will give you meat and you will eat. You will eat not for one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days, but for a whole cotton picking month <laughs> until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes nauseating to you because you have rejected the Lord who's among you and wept before him. Why did we ever leave Egypt? You see, they weren't trusting God. This is what Satan wants to do. He wants to get into our belief system and get us to doubt God's goodness and get us to doubt God's purposes. But if we know God, then we know the same God chose the suffering we seek to avoid. He's with us in that suffering and he's shown, shown us how to walk through hard times. Philippians 2, 14 through 16 says to do everything without complaining or arguing so that here's that so that again no one can criticize you live clean innocent lives as children of God shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people hold firmly to the word of, of life then on the day of Christ's return I'll be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless you know we're not talking about inauthentic lives right I think the world needs to see real Christians who, when they're going through real hard times, are honest about that, but they aren't complaining. They're saying, God is my portion. This is hard. I don't understand it, but I know he does. And I know he's sovereign. And I know somehow the God of this universe is going to use this mess to bless, right? He's going to use it for my good and his glory. And I don't deserve that. What a better attitude would that be? If our world could see that, maybe more people would be saved because they would understand that God's grace is enough. And it isn't Christians seeking to be fat and happy. It's Christians seeking to live this abundant life that Christ promised, abundant in the fire and out of the fire. Abundant joy that we can have at all times. Psalm 142 is a sweet reminder. I want to read that to you, verses 1 through 7, which is the entire psalm. I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. See, this is okay. Cry out to God. It's not complaining and whining. It's crying out. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. When I'm overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. God, you know it all. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Then I pray to you, O Lord. I say you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. You see, that's it right there. Is God what we want or is it our way that we want? Is God what we want or is it deliverance from our problems that we want? One of the sweetest moments for me was standing in a courtroom when instead of wanting deliverance, I realized, God, I just want you to be glorified in this mess. I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how you can turn this mess into something that will bless. But I just want you to be glorified. That's all I want. And see, that wasn't my natural. That's a, a spiritual moment where God worked in my, my complaining and my, my hurt heart and helped me to have a different perspective. 
Hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. Can we say, God, you're good to me, even when we don't get our way? Or are we like toddlers who kick and scream, wanting to go back to slavery because we don't like God's provision? That convicts me. Not in a judgmental way, but in a way that hopefully will be stirred up to re have a fresh perspective on God's provision in our lives. The scripture of the day is out of Numbers eleven twenty nine. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them all. So, after the episode with manna, Joshua noticed other people prophesying and told Moses about it. Don't you know that we can get territorial, right? You know, I've had people tell me, oh, this person thinks that their worship team is better than you. I had that. And then I had people tell me, oh, everyone thinks you're better than... That is all of the flesh. It's wrong. It's sin. You know, I love Moses' attitude. And we're going to get to the root of his attitude, just like we got to the root of a complaining spirit. But it is all about kingdom mentality. I want everybody to flourish. I want everybody's ministry to flourish. Let's be about sharing God's good news with everybody who will hear. Because I am going to reach whoever God has me to reach, and someone else is going to reach whoever God has them to reach. We're not in competition. <laughs> so I love Moses' response. And let's look at it in a little bit more context. And so this is 11 verses 24 through 20, no, through 30. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. He brought 70 men from the elders of the people and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord descended in a cloud and spoke to them. He took some of the spirit who was on Moses and placed the spirit on the 70 elders. As the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they never did it again. Two men had remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad kind of cute they rhyme but anyway the spirit rested on them they were among those listed but had not gone out to the tent and they prophesied in the camp a young man ran and reported to Moses Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp Joshua son of Nun <laughs> that name always cracks me up <laughs> anyway assistant to Moses since his youth responded Moses my lord stop them but Moses asked him, are you jealous on my account? If only all the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would place his spirit on them. Moses is like, I need some help, y'all. Everybody prophesy, please. Then Moses returned to the camp along with the elders of Israel. Friends, Moses had a secret. Humility. In Numbers 12, 3, it says Moses was a very humble man, more so than anyone anyone on the face of the earth. Moses would pour out his cares before God when he was surrounded by a throng of whiners, but Moses' heart did not doubt God. He just knew where to go when life was hard, and he was truly humble. We fight a complaining spirit in our lives, within our own heart, with humility. You see, when we will stop ourselves Check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. When we got complaining, rising in our spirit, you can feel that little flesh rising up. We need to get ourselves on our knees and say, God, forgive me. Help me not to complain. You've allowed this in my life. I don't understand it, but I know who you are. I know your character. I know you're good. And so pouring out our complaints to God is different than complaining about God. God's people were rejecting God who was with them. May we not reject God. May we be thankful for him. The truly humble understand that we truly deserve nothing. Well, y'all, I love the reading in Numbers today. I don't know about y'all, and this I had bedhead this morning, so <laughs> thank God for hats. <laughs> I will tell you, this has been a challenge this year, um, but it's been so good to do this every day. Thank you guys for being here with me. God, and I'm going to put that link uh, for Keith Green's song. I think you'll enjoy that. And you guys have a blessed day. And Lord willing, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.